So I'll be talking about testing in, with, within Django and all of that. To be fair, I'm not an expert on the Django test framework, though, um, and I'm not exaggerating that, but I'll try to share as much as I know and keep you entertained for this talk. This is, in fact, my first time attending Under the Hood. <clears throat> all the previous times, uh, the universe got me redirected to someplace else, unfortunately. It is fairly easy to find me on the internet. Nevertheless, here's my Twitter handle. I am a backend developer who writes web apps in Django, like all of you. I'm one of the potatoes. Uh, we are a web agency <laughs> based in London, and we are mostly known in the Django world as the people who befriended Django's ORM with Appengen's cloud data store, and also the ones who created those cute mesh light installations. I even got a specific color. I got a purple one. <laughs> so I'd like to start with a quick run through the history of Django's test framework. So let's take a trip from version 1.0 to 1.10. About 10 years ago, sometime before Django was out of beta, um, before releasing 1.0, this ticket gets created. We are still at four-digit ticket numbers, and this one is titled Add Unit Test Framework for End User Django Applications. The ticket lists all the possible benefits of having an integrated framework for end users to test their Django apps. And there's this killer argument as an added incentive, this is a feature that is present in Rails. I see the courtier is just having a blast. <laughs> so that's how it all started. To be exact, it started with a management command, test. Test command accepts uh, test labels. Labels at the time are pseudopaths, so you get app.testclass.testmethod. And this is the test runner. Test runner is a variable that points to a function that runs the test. Being exposed as a setting meant you could write your own test discoverer and runner. The test runner would set up the test environment and would look for tests in files named test.py and models.py only. So you might be asking yourself why models.py? Because models.py contained doc tests that were very popular at the time. Doc tests were used to test ORM a lot. Models.py was meant to hold model and application-specific tests, sometimes spawning several screens of doc strings with tests. Everything else was left to test.py. At the very end, the test runner would tear down the test environment and return the results. Client makes its appearance in version 1.0 as a basic stateful browser mimicking stub that constructs requests, passes them to the views, and returns a response, bypassing all the networking altogether by interacting directly with the WSG interface. At its core, it's still the same client that we have today, just a more limited one. Another famous figure appears is the test case. Test case is essentially an extension of the unit test, test case class because it can load fixtures, clean the stub your mailbox, initialize the client, clean the data after each test and it provides a, a couple of helper assert methods, which are still available today. Version 1.1 comes shortly after, and with a restful set of HTTP methods, RESTful APIs are not yet the next big thing, but Django is looking into the future and decides to add put, had, delete, and options. Someone else makes its appearance. It's the transaction test case. This is when a clear distinction is being made what is a test case and what is a transaction test case. So the test case acts like a burger. It drops each test into an atomic block. So you enter a transaction, you run the test, the test will do messy things to your database, then you roll back that transaction so that you leave a clean slate for the next test. Because of that, the test case class will prevent code from issuing any commits or rollback operations on the database to ensure that the final rollback at the very end uh, will restore the database to its initial state. This refactor of the test case led to better performance. But what if you need to test code that involves transactions? Well, 
no problem. Transaction test case to the rescue. Transaction test case is fine with you doing transactions. It will clean after each test by flushing the database at the start of each test. By the way, the previous version of the test case in version 1.0 was doing exactly that. 1.2 brings a couple of improvements and interesting features. Um, Django defines a new interface for test runners. Those should be classes with a method called run tests that acts as an entry point. By default, Django provides this class, which is Django test suit runner. There's a very subtle and interesting bug discovered in this period. Um, so the test runner returns the number of errors and failures summed together. And what Django did, it would spit out the number of failed tests as a sys exit. So you've got zero tests have failed, that branch won't be executed because of the if conditional, and that will naturally exit with a zero, which is success, that is fine. If you've got one, that would be a failure. If you've got 42, that's a failure as well. 256 failed tests, whoops, this value will overflow into a zero. Respectively, 257 will overflow into a 1, which is going to be incorrectly a failure, but within, with an incorrect count. And talking from experience, it's not very complicated to get 256 failing tests or more. <laughs> In fact, what is interesting when I was researching that is that system codes actually have meanings. For example, 130 means that the script was terminated with control C. But we, this was fixed and how it was fixed by casting the number of failed tests to a boolean. So what happens now is that we always get zero for success and one for whatever number of failures we've got. Um, on the next slide, you'll see that you know, the boolean disappeared is because Tim just today merged a patch that removed that weird way of figuring out if it's a failure. So let's just return one. And with the new fix, 256 failed tests, are always going to be a failure. Um, take a look at the definition of the test runner. Something changed from the previous version, and that's the fail fast. Whoops. This is a new argument that allows you to terminate the test run on the first failure that you encounter, and it's very handy. Ever since the implementation within Django has been removed because it's available in the Python unit test library. Django has support for multiple databases with a replication strategy. So you can, you've got a primary database, and multiple replicas can be created. This is how it looks like in your DB setting. So you've got, you've got your default database and the replica. And if this test mirror setting is missing, then during tests there won't be any replication, just the default database will be created and tested against. So to simulate replication, Django allows you to set up a test mirror. At some point later, settings will be changed and get bundled together. So if you want to set up a replica, uh, a test mirror nowadays, this is how you do it. So back to what will happen when the test environment is configured. A test version of replica won't be created. Instead, the connection to replica will be redirected to point to default. As a result, writes to default will appear on the replica, but not because they're actually the same database, but because there is... Um, I said it the other way. <laughs> but because they're actually the same database and not because there is some data replication happening between the two databases. So 1.3 brings um, joy and goodies. Uh, the test case and the transaction test case get two new assets. We see a split of the two roles that the test client embodied at the time. The role of manufacturing request was turned over to request factory and obtaining the response was left to the client. Request Factory became part of the public documented API. As we see from the diagram, the Request Factory is a parent class to the client, and this is how it is still nowadays. To me, and that is certainly disputable, this doesn't make a lot of sense because um, this is not a, is a relationship between the Request Factory and the client. Those are two separate, uh, conceptually, two separate entities. And also, it ties the client to only one specific way of creating requests. So, we can do better by using composition, and um, I'd suggest during sprints we could discuss any back backwards compatibility issues with this problem or any concerns and maybe make it better. So how do we manufacture requests with the request factory? By creating WSGI request objects directly, 
with a set of WSGI and request specific attributes. So like URL scheme, protocol, request method, payload cookies, and all of that. And there's nothing else that it does. It is simply a factory. So dog tests. In the beginning, it seemed like such a great idea. You get both tests and documentation. <laughs> In the long run, it became a nuisance to debug. It also became apparent that doctors aren't really good at providing neither high-quality documentation nor comprehensive tests. That's why doctors will be, will be discovered, discouraged to be used in the future. And this is a good example of a big project going through a love stage with doctors and proving that this relationship just simply cannot work. There are two useful um, internal Django testing, um, useful for internal Django testing and for those who write reusable Django apps. There are two decorators, skip the test on a condition or unless a DB feature is supported by database. So in 1.4, the family of the test case classes receives an expansion pack. We've got two new kids on the block. It's the simple test case and live server test case. Simple test case is lighter than test case and company because it doesn't hit the database, which means there, are, there is no setup teardown, there are no DB queries involved. Live server test case runs an HTTP server for you so that you can use a testing framework like Selenium. And it is based on the transaction test case. So we are halfway there. Version 1.5 is the time when Python 3 support lands in Django. Um, the file about testing in Django becomes so big that we get a whole new section of the tutorial dedicated uh, to testing and covers basic and more advanced topics. As usual, we see new assertions uh, added to our test case classes, such as comparing JSONs and XMLs. So remember we talked about the transaction test case flushing strategy. And we said it, it flushes before each test. Well, other test runners become popular at the time and, and realize that there is a bit of a mass left by the transaction test case. Flushing the database after flushing the database before each task uh, should be the other one. Flushing the database after each test case isn't that good of an idea, so it has been changed to flush the DB. Yeah, it's the other way. So flushing the database before each test case isn't that good of an idea, so it has been changed to flush after. Um, so here's what happens. So you first you flush the database and then you get um, and then you run the transaction test case, then you run the test case wrapped in a transaction, and boom, you get dirty state right in there. Um, this is why Django test runner is always rearranging tests so that test cases run first and then, and then the transaction test cases and then eventually the doc tests. Transaction test cases um, leave a dirty state at the very end, but that's fine because the DB will be destroyed eventually. But if we flush um, after each transaction test case, we get no dirty state and the problem is solved and everybody's happy. This holds true today. This is how it's done. In 1.6, a patch is being added to the list of client HTTP methods, and if you thought the list is complete by now, nope, it's not. We see some other improvements to the testing framework. We get a new test runner that is able to locate tests not only in models.py and test.py, but anywhere from the installed apps as long as it matches specific file patterns. The new test discovery also means no more tests in models.py. Hooray. Pseudopaths are being removed, so there's no more app.testclass.test method, but real file system dotted or directory paths. This also allows running tests that are not inside a Django app listed in installed apps. And finally, doc, doc tests won't be discovered anymore. Say farewell to doc tests. So in 1.7, um, Three versions before, I haven't mentioned that, but before, three versions before, Django introduced Unit Test 2. Unit Test 2 is a backport of Unit Test features that work with older versions of Python, like 2.4. And since at that time Django was supporting that version, it was vendoring the Unit Test lib. And in 1.7, Django dropped support for older versions, so we go back to Unit Test. An interesting split happens. 
Um, at first, when live server test case was introduced, it was serving all the static files. Um, at this point, live server test case will serve files only from the static route, simulating the real production environment. And if you want to serve any static files, any static, fi static files from your app, use static live server test case. Live, um, live server test case uh, at this point becomes less powerful, but also um, it has less magic. And in 1.8, we get trace, and this is complete, and you won't see this slide again with the client. <clears throat> we are done. In version 1.8, test case suffers some important and intricate changes to how it runs tests. So before that, we think that version 1.7. What test case did is, as we already know, wrapped each test into a transaction. So what it will do, it will enter the atomic block, it will load the fixtures, execute one test, exit the atomic, uh, base, in other words, roll back the transactions and will close all the database uh, and will close the database connection for cleanup. And that will that whole procedure will repeat for each test. Now with Django 1.8, before loading fixtures, it will enter another transaction which will, roll, which will be rolled back at the very end. So everything else that, ha that will happen will be sandwiched in this one big hug. This means load fixtures once or use setup test data, also called a single time, and execute every test in another transaction as well, like this. So and the first transaction will happen only once. What is the gain? Obviously the speed, because uh, you don't need to load the fixtures every time and you don't need to close the connections for every single test. In 1.9, um, support for parallelizing tests lands in Django. The tests are parallelized using Python multiprocessing module, which means it's mostly useful for I.O. bound tests. Obviously, tests should be as pure as possible, not trying to access any shared resources between the processes, for example, like files. And by the way, Django's own test suite is also being parallelized. So how does it work? First, it spawns a couple of workers. If you don't specify how many, it will just pick up the max number of cores that you have. Each process will get its own database. So therefore, if we have four workers, we're going to have four databases. Now, the test discovery builds a suite of tests. This whole load of tests will be partitioned into chunks of test case classes, preserving the order of the suite. Workers will pick up those subsuites of tests and run them. Once some of the workers are finished, they will report the result and pick up the next. Uh, chunks until we are done with all the tests and return the final result. If you're stuck with a version prior to 1.9, then don't lose your hopes. Uh, there, is, there are other options, for example, like Nose multi-process plugin. It's also using Python multiprocessing module. But the main difference between Django's parallel and Nose multi-process is that you get only one database, and because of the shared sta state, there could be bizarre, unexplainable test errors and failures. And finally, 1.10 will introduce various improvements and speed-ups, but my favorite one is the tags. You can tag your tests, creating buckets of certain types of tests that you'd like to run together or exclude from the test run. Similar feature is implemented by other test runners like Nose and PyTest, so if you're not on Django 1.10, you always have the option to do the same with Nose Atrib plugin or PyTest markers. So we've been going through the history of Django Test Framework, and we've touched on a different topics here and there, but let's see the flow of running tests, a, a test suite as a whole, and what happens when you run uh, manage.py test, basically just nicknamed testbad. So let's split the testbad into multiple pieces and analyze each one and see what is happening under the covers. First, we invoke the management command test. Uh, so let's zoom in, and there's pretty much a straightforward invocation. So we get the test runner class, we create an instance of it by passing a bunch of options, and we run the test. So let's zoom in even more. Inside, run tests. First line in run tests is setting up 
the testing environment. This will include a bunch of things. So the main three key points of this method are setting up the LockMum email backend so that uh, all email that we send will be stored into a stub list, easy to access and assess our assumptions about email sending. This is a very reduced email backend in its functionality. Django template Render method is being replaced by an instrumented test render method. Before rendering, it will send a signal that is a way to let others know uh, that the template will be rendered. And that's how the test client returns a response that has extra information like the template context and the templates that were used to render the response because it's listening on, on this event. And finally, deactivate translations so that Tests will respect your project set language. Those settings are rigid and can't be configured from the outside. This is what Django does in a very closed way. So next step after setting the test environment is to build the suite of tests. The heavy load of building the suite is done by the Python unit test lib. But Django extends some of its functionality by allowing, allowing you to specify tags, patterns, debug mode, number of cores for parallelizing tests, etc., etc. So it builds a suite of tests. Think of it as an aggregation of all the tests from the current directory or from the test label or tag or whatever you provided. At this point, it's just instances of test case classes all collected in a single place and nothing more. So then we go and we set up the uh, databases. We run the suite of tests. Running tests is completely delegated to the unit test text test runner. And for the cleanup, we'll first destroy all the databases that were created, unless we said to keep the database. This action being delegated to the connection object. Um, how it knows what exactly to destroy? Well, when we were creating the databases set up databases function returned a list of all the DBs that it has created, and this is being stored in a simple namespace. Afterwards, tear down the test environment. Um, it is essentially the reverse order of what setup test environment did. It will restore all the settings that it has modified initially um, by storing the original, init because initially it stored the original values into a simple namespace object. So bring back the original email backend, the test renderer, and finally delete the state and the mailbox. And finally, return the result of the test suite uh, by combining the number of total failures and errors. Those lines should look familiar to you at this point. Let's take a closer look at all the test classes and how they relate to each other. This is the hierarchy where the simple test case is at the very top. It's being subclassed by transaction test case, this, this one respectively being subclassed by test case and live server test case. And finally, the specialized version uh, of the live server test case being static live server test case. Those class names are so long. Simple test case is very fast because it doesn't interact with the database. It has access to the client, though. Um, use it as a slightly more advanced version of the usual unit test, uh, test case class. Transaction test case is not fast at all. It will allow database queries and transactions, and it will flush the database after each test. Test case is faster than transaction test case, but not as fast as simple test case. It will restrict database transactions because it runs each test in its own transaction. Live server test case acts as a transaction test case and it will launch a live HTTP server in a separate thread from the other thread that's running the tests. And the static live server test case is a specialization of the live server test case that uh, in addition to everything, will also serve all the static files. Client is an important utility for testing Django apps. The three core actors involved in browser mimicking are request factory client and client handler, though those are not the only ones, but just the main ones. 
We've talked about Request Factory having the most straightforward role. It constructs requests and it encodes data. That's all it does. Client, on the other hand, performs more actions. First off, the client object is stateful. It retains cookies and sessions for the duration of the client. It also does a few other things. If you remember, we mentioned that when we are setting up the environment, we are using an instrumented template renderer. Well, the client is listening to this to events such as template render to be able to set the list of templates and template context on the response object. Um, also, it sets on the response uh, a couple of other things like the original request, the client, uh, JSON, resolve a match. It also handles redirects and builds a redirect chain for your inspection. Another important player in the game is the um, client handler that inherits from the HTTP base handler. Um, the main goal of the handler is to return a Django HTTP response with the WSGI request attached to it. It will load all the middleware set in settings. It will disable CSRF checks, which can be enabled back if you want to. And it emulates as close as possible server and browser behavior by stripping down content uh, for some of the requests, same as browsers do. And it will send a signal that the request has started. And this is it. We've talked about what are the tools that Django provides for testing. But how do we achieve quality in our tests? How do we make sure the tests that we write are reliable, future-proof, and are fast enough? Reasoning about quality isn't easy. Besides human understanding of quality, there are actually some of the tools that can help us. So let's start with something very simple. Introduce Factory Boy to your tests. Lots like it because of its shortcut methods for creating models. In fact, it doesn't do that with some static fixture-like data, but rather with some random yet realistic data. For creating that, it relies on another library called Faker or Fake Factory in the past. Faker has a bunch of providers that, based on certain rules, create this random data. The important part, though, is that Every time you run your tests, you will get different values. And there is a slight chance that this library will catch a bug for you. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, I'd suggest looking into Python's uh, Hypothesis library. It's a library that does property-based testing, and it takes the idea of the random input to a whole new level. Property-based testing came from initially from a Haskell library called QuickCheck, and Hypothesis is the Pythonic implementation. It uses a decorator called Given to inject randomly generated data into the test, the values being based on specific strategies, for example, in this case, based on the text strategy. Uh, strategies are similar to factory boys uh, or fakers providers. It will run this test, so the tests that get are decorated with the given, will run the test multiple times, about 200 times, with all sorts of edge cases data that easily slip away from developers' attention. Since Django is an established way of doing web in the Python world, Hypothesis comes with an extra module called uh, for support of Django. So similar to Factory Boy, we can create models populated with random data. Um, to be noted, when we're using uh, models.example, uh, Hypothesis will always save the created model. So this is a real-world example, and I know it's a lot of uh, code at this point. I'm not asking you to read it straight away. Um, this is a real-world example of how Pythos Hypothesis can be useful for testing Django apps. If you look at the very top, the most important bit from the imports is the usage of the hypothesis test case to be able to wrap each hypothesis test into its own transaction rather than running all 200 of them into a single atomic block. So let's throw away uh, the imports and focus on the test. This is a slightly stripped down example that I borrowed from a presentation made at the Django local user group 
group in London by the author of Hypothesis David. Um, so what we're testing here? We're testing if the project model instance is able to respect the limit of users a single project can have. So the first thing we do, we use the given decorator and we inject one project model instance and a list of random amount from 0 to 20 of user models. Then we check if the project is at its collaboration limit and by trying to add another user, we expect an exception to be raised. Otherwise, adding users should work just fine and we can check if the user is a member of the project. Hypothesis will run this test multiple times and if it will encounter that the test didn't succeed with a set of randomly generated data, it will shout at you falsifying example. A project with a limit of one and two new users where the second one didn't trigger an exception is a falsifying example. Yes, I, I know, dumb tests suddenly became very complicated with for testing this, we had to add a loop and a couple of conditionals, and it seems like this test might actually need uh, tests for itself. But when used properly and timely, property-based testing can be a very valuable tool. Test code coverage is probably the most known and widely used metric. I can tell you that at this point in Django, the test coverage is 76%, more or less. And here's why I don't like code coverage. It's generally a very deceptive metric. If I have low code coverage, then yes, I probably need to write more tests. But if I have high code coverage, that doesn't mean anything except that I've hit at least once every single line of code. Though 76% mean that 76% of code lines were hit at least once in any way, and it doesn't matter how complicated are, are my lines. Code coverage is not suitable for asserting the quality of tests. High code coverage simply doesn't imply high quality of tests. And we can do better. We can do better with a different concept called mutation testing. Mutation testing isn't a new concept. It has been around since the 70s. Um, what it does, it involves changing the source code of the program in small ways and observing what happens when we run the tests. So just think about it. This is such a powerful tool. In Python, mutation testing is implemented using a, a package called MutePy. MutePy does the job but it hasn't been updated since 2014. As I imagine, there isn't a lot of excitement around mutation testing. So here's how we invoke mutation testing from the shell. We say mute.py and we specify the target, which is going to be our source code that is going to be mutated, and the unit test that is testing this specific uh, piece of code. Say our target source code has this if statement with a logical operand and. If foo and bar, then something should happen. MutePy takes this logical operand and inverts it from an and to an or. So our target source code becomes a slightly modified version of the original. And we call it a mutant. Now we run the test on the mutant. If the test failed on the mutant, this is good. We say the mutant was killed by our tests. This will add points to our mutation score. But if the mutant survived and has a happy smile on its face, then our test isn't good enough. It means that it doesn't really matter whether we use an AND or an OR, our test will pass anyway. We are not testing it properly. And MutePy can do a lot more. There's a fairly long list of different mutants. It can replace arithmetic operands, break continuous statements, conditional operands, constants logical uh, operators. It can delete whole conditional branches and remove decorators, and a lot more. This is what a stripped-down result of a test run with uh, MutePy looks like. 
You get a mutation score, which is a percentage, uh, similar how you get it with code coverage. It also tells you the total amount of mutants, number of killed mutants, the ones that survived, incompetent, and timed out. So what I did, I took this tool and started playing a little bit with the Django tests. Uh, so I'll share some of the results that I got. There is one, there is a pleasant trend, uh, which is the correlation of high code coverage with high mutation score. So for example, the duration utils uh, from Django have 89% mutation score and they have 91% for code coverage. But that doesn't hold true always. For example, Django encoding utils, mutation score is 32%, while the coverage is 63% if we run only that one unit test. So this is somewhat okay coverage, some might say, but it has poor quality, according to mutation testing, obviously. Django tutorial is excellent. Um, beginners don't need to search the internet for videos, um, articles or courses on how to learn Django because of the Django official tutorial. Third-party documentation gets easily out of date and is rarely updated. So therefore, part number five of the Django tutorial is dedicated completely to testing. So just think about it. Testing is such an integral part of learning how to use a framework. One of the biggest reasons why developers are not testing is because setting a test framework and building all the test-based code takes time and is tiresome. So it becomes a low priority. So when you create a new app or start project with Django, it's basically shouting at you, hey, I created a test file just for you. Do you want to start running, writing some tests? Testing framework became a very powerful tool to motivate people to write tests, especially beginners. The Django tutorial contains a section called when testing, more is better. It says that yes, soon enough, once your project will grow, you will see that your test base will grow even more and it might seem like it spins out of control, but just let them grow. When testing, more is better. I agree, but there's a trap in there. What happens when, so what happens when testing more is better? is that with time we will see an almost exponential growth of the number of tests. We rarely delete test code. And since Django gives us all the tools and encourages to write functional tests, the speed of our test suffers. Same correlation exists between the number of tests and the total execution time. The more tests we have, the slower our total test run will become. This is what happens when we run functional tests uh, only. And this has all the implications. Slower tests means slower feedback loop. Therefore, um, I assembled three tips on how to speed up your tests, and number five will shock you. <laughs> Use a faster and less secure password hasher. That's what Django does, does for, its, uh, test, uh, for its test also. Consider, and I emphasize consider not use a SQLite in-memory database. For anyone who doesn't do any fancy stuff with the database, you might be just fine with it. Everyone else who has good reasons to test against a proper database, continue doing so. Accuracy over speed in this case. Write more simple test cases when possible and use setup test data if you don't plan to mutate on any of the objects that you create in this method. Use mocks everywhere for all the database interactions. Obviously, I'm kidding. <laughs> be careful what gets created and set up. It might be the case that only a small percentage of the tests in the test case actually need those seven types of users with custom set permissions. Don't save model instances unless uh, you really need to do that. And finally, isolate unit tests. And I would like to talk about the last three points a bit more. So the tight loops might be an indicator that maybe this is not such a good idea to have to create objects and save them to the database in the loop. So identify, remove, or reduce the usage of those as much as possible. Instead of doing create, maybe you could just use an in-memory model. 
Um, similar to that, you can also create an in-memory model with, uh, with the build method or the stop method. And the last two are part of the factory boy API. The caveat here is, though, is that you can't do that if you have many-to-many -many relationships. If you don't, it's much easier. And isolate unit tests. Your test suite might look something like that. It's a mix of somewhat unity tests and functional and integration tests all in one place. It would be more useful and would allow creating a faster feedback loop if we separate unit tests from the rest because unit tests are very fast and we can run them very often. One way to do is to use simple test case for unit tests and you can also tag them with a special label. Um, even better, you can make them simple unit tests or pi tests uh, which have no idea what Django is and write more of them. At the same time, don't neglect functional tests because obviously that's where we validate the contracts between the units. Say you decided to switch jobs and run a little bakery. Um, what a great decision, I must say. And reminiscent of your previous jobs, building apps, you decide it's going to be easy peasy to create a web app to help you out with your little business. Um, you decide to build a feature to help you out with uh, setting the correct VAT, which is a value added tax value to your products. This could save some time for the accountant because you taxes. So let's start with a basic schema. At this point, it's not necessarily the best, but you've got your product model and your product questionnaire model, and there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the two. The product questionnaire is the key to your VAT decision-making. It's a little add-on where we define basic yes or no questions and build a decision tree to eventually land on a defined answer. Is this product zero rated, zero rated VAT or is it standard rated VAT? So we will need a view and a model form. The view will display the questionnaire. The answers will be saved on the model for possible future recalculations. Um, in the same view, we will converge to a final decision and save it to the product instance. With a known VAT, it will be very easy to compute the final price of the product. So I'll be showing um, example code where, for different solutions where on the top we'll have production code and at the very bottom we'll have the test code. So solution number one, in the view, when we know that the form is valid, we check if the product is a biscuit or, and is it coated in chocolate. In that case, let's set the VAT to 20%. As for the test, we will create a product object, we will make a post request, and we will check, we will fetch the product back from the database and we will check if the uh, VAT was set to 20. In reality, we understand that the if else is going to be much longer, uh, we can split it up in multiple methods. The essential part is that the entry point to this calculation is going to happen from the view. And for each branch, we'll have another task and each task will have to create a product object and will have to create a product questionnaire as well and that will be repeated for each one of them for bread, biscuits and flapjacks and all that. So to test if I need to set 20% VAT for biscuits coated in chocolate I need to go through the router, I need to interact with the database to eventually send an input and receive an output. And if you're thinking that to remove the database interactions with mocks, no, this is not the right solution. Let's try again with the solution number two. Um, the conditional check gets moved to a more appropriate place. It's the form. Um, hence, for the test, we will be passing, we will also need to create a product object and we will be passing the data to the questioner form directly. We'll validate it, save it, fetch again the object and check the VAT value. Um, even though we need to create a product object, we no longer are testing the routing, which is better. And then uh, via the form, we are sending the input answers to the questions and receiving an output. The last and final solution is to move the entire decision-making into a plain old Python class. 
somehow we forget that Django is a web framework and not a programming language. And different constructs can live outside the core Django components. The VAT calculator at this point has no idea what Django is and it doesn't even need to. Decoupling has various benefits. Code reusability, if I, if I decide that, well, my decision tree is quite good and maybe I would like to share it with my friends and create a separate web app. Um, extensibility, if I decide to expand my business to a different country which has different uh, VAT values, then it's going to be much easier to update them in a single place where the VAT calculator lives rather than finding <clears throat> the codes related to it splattered all across Django. And finally, testability. There are no more routers, no, there is no more database. It becomes as simple as send an input and receive an output. This approach of isolating business logic allows creating more and faster unit tests and keeping the functional and integration tests at a manageable rate. Tests have more in them than we think. A test has the capability to drive a better app design. In terms of Django, it's about moving complex logic away from any Django-related components. If it's a complex behavior that isn't tied directly to your database or your templates or forms, not even mentioning views, which should stay very simple, then build objects that perform those complex actions and unit test them. Thank you very much and happy testing, everyone. Thank you very much. We have a bunch of questions and about 10 minutes, so we'll see how we get on. Um, let's start with... Uh, there's a lot of work, obviously, in these myriad of test case classes and so on. Um, and a lot of this is potentially duplicated in systems like Nose and PyTest. Do you kind of have an opinion on why we need to have our own test runner at all, whether we should do within Django? What do you think? So the main problem here is that I haven't used PyTest, and I know this problem, this question would come up, so I don't know about the capabilities of the PyTest, but at the same time looking at all the code that Django does to kind of bring up the whole test bed for the testing environment is quite Django specific and tied to some of the internals, which it needs to do in order to run the test. So I feel like it could be stripped down, but we can't remove it altogether. We can't even do it, I think, because of the backwards compatibility issues. We won't just say, you know, we won't be supporting that anymore. So what, what do you think is missing from Django's testing tool suite, tool set? You know, what, if we went through everything from 1.1 to 1.10. What should be in 1.11? What should be in version 2? Uh, we probably might get easy, pluggable um, components, for example, for setting up your testbed to having a different uh, mailbox stub, which will be <laughs> much nicer. Uh, with, so I asked Andrew, and with channels, we'll get a bunch of new testing capabilities as well. Uh, so we'll see some improvements there as well. Um, the hypothesis-based testing, the property-based testing, looks like a great idea. Um, Obviously, you said about dealing with the performance with the RM stuff. How bad is it when you start doing that with the RM as well? Um, do you think that's a good idea, or are you just digging yourself a hole to do property-based testing with hitting the database at the same time? I wouldn't do property-based testing with hitting the database. I would just leave it for more unit testy tests. Uh, probably even with the SQLite in memory, it might be still very slow to wait for 200 tests to finish. Uh, but for So you would think you would isolate the critical components of your production app, and if you want to have very good, reliable tests, you might do that and then just run them on a CI, if you're fine waiting for them. Okay. Um, how can Django sort of encourage developers to code in that way, to pull their logic out? <laughs> into other systems rather than putting it all there? What do you, we recommend advocating that? 
The entry point for that might be documentation mentioning. So there is nothing in the docs that says you sh <sighs> Maybe every single component of the Django could say specify that, you know what, this kind of things shouldn't be living here. For example, being more explicit about the views be uh, not bloating them with every single possible type of logic. Uh, it, I know it already discourages complex, uh, complex conditionals or behavior in the templates, basically by just stripping down and not allowing doing that. I think probably documentation could be improved and that could be worked on during sprints. Great. Um, I suppose in order to, when you've got an existing test suite that's big and has got lots of tests in it, how do you feel about, how do you go about finding out where your problems are and where, how do you, you know, I've got a test suite, I run it, it takes me 20 minutes to run my test suite, what do I do now? The tests are probably isolated by modules, so you can run modules separately, find out if uh, it feels like some of them are being too slow. With the setup, you will see um, how you can easily identify if you're having too much uh, interactions with the database, if you're creating a lot of objects, for example, in the setup, is that when you will be looking at the dots that appear as success, you will see that there will be a very big gap and if you see it constantly for a big chunk, it means your problem is there. So just by observing it, some of the tests might be as slow as you actually have to, you know, a couple of seconds for a single test to complete. So obviously one of the other places where you spend a lot of time setting your tests up is in, within this test bed up setup. The test bed setup and tear down time. Tear down quite quick, but setup can be quite slow. Um, what are your thoughts on the fact the test runner runs all of the migrations um, each time you set this set the test suite up? I work with the data store. We don't have migrations, but for everybody else who uses a proper database, a relational database, uh, I don't know if there is a workaround not running migrations for every single model that you have. Uh, would it, would it make a difference? So I don't know here. When you've got a bunch of migrations, so you've got like 10 migrations, so the Django will run each one of them? No, it, run, it, it just runs all of the migrations at the beginning, but it takes a lot longer than a sort of old-fashioned SyncDB setup yeah. where it just flushes the current state of your models. Could um, it be possible to like concatenate all of the migrations into a single one and then you have to run only a, sing, a, sing, sing, a single migration? There, are, there is a way to do it. Yeah, because we use that in Django test suite ourselves, don't we? There's a, there's a magic button you can press. <laughs> and it, okay, it's, it's a documented magic button you can press. Um, the other thing you can do is use KeepDB, um, which saves you a bunch of time on s at least su successive test runs locally. Again, that doesn't really work with App Engine, so... Um, cool. So when you when you've got um, multiple test test databases, um, you've got multiple database system. Um, how can we set it up? Um, Django only flushes the default database every time. Do you have any recommendations about how to work around that problem? If you want to flush all of them, then you have to basically rewrite the cores. You can't just easily do that. That's why if somebody, that is a good thing that somebody actually has a proper use case that, you know, I would like to have a different flushing strategy because I am testing against multiple databases. So I think we just need to look into the core and make it more pluggable, separate some of those things that people want to have access to. You can't do it right now just easily, sorry. Um. What tools, tips, or tricks do you have for testing with files, especially image files, or so on? Ew. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> I have this problem all the time. I work at a photography website. I've seen, I think, people trying to uh, find out solutions, like if you're testing uh, with PDFs, you're just going to have a very minimum kind of uh, test uh, a folder with some test file, and you'll have like the minimum possible super tiny PDF file or an image, a JPEG, or whatever. Um, Muck around with your storage back end is another good approach. Uh. Sometimes. <laughs> but yeah. Um, 
And I, finally, um, what do you think Django could do to improve its own test suite? You know, sort of taking all of these ideas, you mentioned a bunch of things like Factory Boy and Hypothesis and so on, that do you think we should be using these to make, our, make Django's own test suite better and make it, make it faster as well? Because it takes still quite a long time to run. It takes about 10 minutes, parallelized. Yeah, Depending on which database. Oh yeah, that is true. But you have, you have the CI, you have Jenkins, and it all runs there, parallelized with multiple machines. Um, yeah, I think looking at the Django test base, it has a lot of unit tests, so I think it's, it's much easier to start using Factory Boy or Hypothesis. Uh, why not? Maybe we could write some special decorators that could run that only on CI and not on local environments for, on, for developers on their own machines. Um, the test base is quite, quite big, I would say. There is a lot of stuff in there, a lot of regression which needs to be there, but maybe we could go through and identify some of the things that could be improved. I, I'd love to do that. Like, if somebody is interested, uh, let's do it during sprints. Excellent. Thank you very much, Anna.